Well, good morning. How is everyone doing out there? It's Sunday, and we're so excited to be with you here at New Sound Church. Uh, we're doing a little bit different today. We're doing a live service of our sermon series continuing through the book of Galatians. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to give a special shout out. Uh, shout out this Sunday to all teachers. Uh, my wife is a teacher, so I've personally seen firsthand how preparing for the school year, even uh, if you're teaching online, if you're going back to the building, if you're doing some sort of asynchronous work, you are amazing. And so I just want to give a shout out to all the teachers out there that are preparing uh, and, and, and already engaged in school. Uh, and we've been praying for you. We've been praying for our students. We've been praying for our world as we know it's a very difficult time. Um, and there's no perfect solution to all the struggles that we're facing. But I just wanted to give a special shout out to all the teachers out there who are doing amazing things. And also, um, we must not forget that in this time, many people are taking first steps or continued steps and their relationship with God. Um, and so that's very exciting. It's one of the things that um, brings me energy and joy during this time of quarantine. Some close friends that I know got baptized uh, this week, or this past week, I should say, and, and just what a joy uh, and what a celebration that was. And so, yeah, so I just feel um, kind of moved in my spirit to remind us um, that there are so many good things happening um, in an individual lives and in communities. And uh, it's always a pleasure um, when we can see and celebrate steps that people are taking. Maybe they're starting out a business for the very first time. Maybe they got baptized, like I just mentioned one of our, my friends did. Um, maybe they're just making some key changes in their life during this time as a result of reflection and realizing that God was really trying to speak to them about key areas of their life. Um, and so that's a huge thing. So shout out to those teachers. Shout out to those who are taking next steps in order to make their life um, better uh, to grow further in Christ, to connect with community, um, to respond to God's call in whatever area that he's calling them in. And so that's really exciting. So I just wanted to celebrate that today. Well, as I said a moment ago, for the past few weeks, our church family has been diving into the book of Galatians, really trying to get a deep dive into this letter. Um, and so today we're going to start with Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, Go ahead and open to Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And it reads, Then after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy out the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. If you underline in your Bible, I would suggest underlining that phrase right there, the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. So this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All that they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So that's Galatians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. And this is where we're going to camp uh, for today's message. And I want to encourage you, um, as we go through this book, 
there's a lot of history sometimes that we have to unpack in the Bible to really understand it in its proper context. And so uh, I don't know if there's any history buffs out there, but I am a big history buff. And what I mean by that is I will watch ridiculous documentaries that people, uh, I don't know, normal people don't normally watch, all right? So, um, for example, on History Channel, uh, one of my favorite channels, you can watch uh, a history of pretty much anything that's happened in the world. They've pretty much covered a lot of subjects, but one of the most recent ones that I watched was the history of samurai in Japan. Now, this is fascinating. Okay, Tom Cruise was not the last samurai. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it out there, but but no, it's so amazing when you learn about the history of the samurai in Japan, right? And I remember the last history documentary I watched was about uh, the history of Samurai Musashi, okay? Fascinating, okay? You, you learn about where he went, um, you learn about the teachings of the samurai, the discipline of their way of life, how the swords were made, which is really super awesome, how they heat the steel and bend it. Anyway, so I'm a big nerd on this stuff, right? And so, I, you know, what I find is that those who like history, like me, you know, can maybe go back in the Bible and read some things and start to connect the dots and see how it's one unified story of God and that there really is purpose in every, in every single word that is in here. Um, but sometimes it's easy to miss uh, the forest between the trees, if you will, um, because what we're talking about, specifically in Galatians, has to do a lot with the history of the Jewish people and how now, since Jesus Christ came and died on a cross, he opened the door for the, the faith to spread to other nations. Now, Israel had always been commissioned to be a light for the nations, but they always struggled to obey God in that way, and they always fell short themselves of following God the way he instructed them. But when Jesus came, he flipped the game, all right? He changed the scene. And so all history was... Uh, I guess coming to its proper end in Jesus, and so that's where we got to, like I said, we got to kind of be a little history buffs th uh, this morning and dive into the scripture to understand truly what it's saying to us. So beginning again in Galatians chapter 2 verse 1, Paul says he went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus, and this is significant because in Galatians chapter 1, um, he is making his defense for the gospel. Because as we said before, there were people who came from Jerusalem, Jewish Christians, to the Galatian churches and were teaching that they were sent from Jerusalem to teach them something that Paul had left out. That Paul had not told them the whole truth about the gospel, that in fact he was missing some key points, and that the Galatian churches themselves were missing out on following Christ all the way. And so this was a very significant uh, charge that they made against Paul and his teaching and that they were letting the churches know like, hey, you, you don't just need Jesus. You need Jesus and circumcision. You need Jesus and to follow certain dietary laws of the Torah. You need Jesus and Sabbath. And remember what we said before, Jesus and anything else for, for full acceptance and favor with God is a different gospel. That was whole, all Galatians chapter one, Paul's coming out spitting fire saying, no, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. And so in Galatians 2, Paul is speaking specifically to the fact that even though he's not from, quote unquote, Jerusalem and sent by Jerusalem, he's got an even better sending uh, uh, church, if you will. He's got Jesus Christ himself who had actually appeared to Paul and sent him on the missions that he had, he had gone and preached on. And so uh, he, he first makes that defense in uh, Galatians chapter 1. But then when, as we get to Galatians chapter 2, he's wanting us to know that, hey, he's been to Jerusalem too. And he's got a few things to say about that. So it says again in verse 2, I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. And so let's break that down just a little bit. Paul says he went in response to a revelation. What uh, the New Testament and the most of the letters of Paul um, really signify to us 
is just this reflection of how the New Testament church was born and how it was really cutting its teeth, you know, how it was coming in to be into the world. And so everything was so new. Everything was so fresh. Everything was so revolutionary because remember, Jesus Christ had died on the cross and then rose again. And, and all that were believing in him um, and all that were preaching this message were being filled by the Holy Spirit. And then subsequently going out into the world and testifying about the resurrection of Jesus. This was such a different message. It was such a, a, a magnanimous and miraculous claim. It was turning whole cities upside down. It was turning whole lives upside down in a good way. They were coming a new life. And all of a sudden in these cities and, and these um, businesses and these leaders and every, every single thing about that day was being changed by the gospel going out. And so, of course, there rose up problems in that. There rose up opposition to that. There rose up um, countercultural customs where, because Jesus was teaching love for everybody and freedom. And so people who were um, in bondage or making money off the oppression of others, they were very angry that this gospel was freeing people the way that it does. Very angry that this gospel was actually helping people walk with God and, and, and leave idolatry, which made somebody, some, a lot of people some money, you know? So there was all these conflicting things that were happening um, during the time that the gospel was being spread, right? And so Paul says um, that he went in response to a revelation. And why I brought that up is because in the church that, Paul's were, that Paul was planting and a part of, the Holy Spirit was active and engaged. He was revealing people their sin. He was bringing them into relationship with Christ. He was healing bodies that were sick. And what we know from um, Corinthians and other passages of scripture is that the Holy Spirit would, was so in the gatherings of the people of God. They, they love gathering together for the love and the fellowship among each other, but the power and the working of God among them by the Holy Spirit. And so when this, we read this word revelation, we take that to mean that the Holy Spirit was speaking directly to the churches, and he was given instructions to the people of God. One of the ways that he does that is through prophecy. Now, this is, might be a little controversial for today, but the New Testament knows prophecy intimately. They know it so deeply as vital to the life of the church. And we here at New Sound Church believe that the Holy Spirit is still active and alive and doing what he does best, which is bringing people to the knowledge of God and helping them to walk and grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit, through the churches that Paul was a part of, um, revealed to Paul that he must go to Jerusalem. Why? To meet privately with those esteemed as leaders. That's the apostles. That is the Peter and James and John specifically that he mentions later in this verse. And he wanted to present to them the gospel that he preached among the Gentiles because he wanted to be sure that he was not running and had not been running his race in vain. That, that reflects back on an Old Testament passage where the prophet Isaiah says that the people of God will not labor in vain. Um, Paul also says later on in, the, uh, in Philippians that he, he wanted to be sure that he was not laboring in vain. So what does that verse really mean? It means that he, he wanted to be sure that he was working with all of his heart, soul, strength, and mind for the God who called him. And that in no way had he been um, uh, swept up in something else, uh, but stayed true to the faithful mission that God had called him on. And so we get the answer to that, that question he was asking, am I running my race in vain? Am I preaching a gospel among the Gentiles that the other apostles don't agree with? Here's where he says, verse three, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So we get that from within Paul's meeting with these esteemed leaders, with these apostles, John and Peter and James. Paul actually brought with him a test. He brought with him Titus, who was a Greek believer in Jesus. And I think this was like a really good um, move on Paul, right? He, he didn't just want to go and speak to them like 
uh, about these issues that were um, being had in the Galatian churches. He wanted to go with the actual test case. Like, hey, here's Titus. He's a Greek. He's not from ethnic Israel. Is he going to be compelled to be circumcised? And the answer is unequivocally no. He was not compelled to be circumcised. Let me back up there. Okay, I just said the word circumcised, and this might be a, not be a familiar word to you um, as you've heard it preached in church, but circumcision was a big deal in the Old Testament. Uh, circumcision was the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And so throughout the ages of Israel's history, circumcision continued on to be a sign and a signal that anyone who was circumcised was part of the family of God. And they were inheritors of the promises that God gave to Abraham. And God gave Abraham some specific promises that he was going to make his name uh, blessed, that, that, the fa- that his, through his family all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that, that God was going to raise up Abraham's family to be a people for his own glory and to inherit all the promises of God. And so that was a very significant thing that circumcision carried in the Old Testament, even on into the New Testament, where we see that many Jewish um, Christians and even non-Jewish Christians um, are struggling with what this whole idea of circumcision means. But when, we, when Jesus comes on the scene, he models for us a perfect Israelite. Listen to me. Even Abraham, even David, even Solomon, all of the Old Testament heroes, if you will, of the day, they could never keep God's ways perfectly. In fact, the Bible makes that apparently clear. That's what I love about the Bible. It's so real to us, okay? Every one of our heroes has fallen short, has sinned has disobeyed God at some level, in some way. And even though they had circumcision, or all the laws of Moses, or all the prophecy, and all these miracles that took place, they still did not follow God all the way. But Jesus Christ, being God's only Son, being born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, was the only person, only human being, that could ever keep God's laws perfectly that could ever, um, never not be jealous of something, that could ever always love his neighbor perfectly, that could, he, he fulfilled all of this book, every single thing uh, that God had told humanity to, to participate in, to walk with him in, Jesus did. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sin and our shame and all those wrong things, including all the things that people had done in years past, and he nailed it to that cross. He took upon uh, himself all our sin, all our shame, all our um, in- inadequacy to follow God the way that he had called us to. And then when he rose again, credited to us his perfect life, his righteousness, his spirit. And so this is what is so um, miraculous about this. Circumcision then um, was no longer needed as a sign as being uh, becoming part of the people of God. Instead, it was trust in Jesus and what he has done. And one of the ways that we publicly signify that is through baptism. So that's why I want to point out here about when we speak about circumcision. That may sound alien to you, but you may have heard the, the term baptism. In the New Testament, baptism replaces circumcision as the initiator into God's covenant people. And what I mean by that is when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you trust him with your life and you become a part of the family of God, the people of God, you are saved. You have no other boxes to check. Jesus checked all the boxes. Jesus paid the penalty for you. And the way, um, one of your first steps of obedience, uh, of identifying with Jesus' work and his new family, is baptism. You get to take the step of baptism. And when you go into, um, you know, whether it's a pool or an ocean or wherever you're baptized, when you go down into that water, you are saying, my life has now, my old life has now died. My new life 
begins as I am raised to life in Jesus Christ. So it is a reflection, again, of the gospel, of, again, of the cross, of, of the fact that now we, are, we were not God's people before, but now we are God's people. And so baptism has replaced that in the New Testament. I thought I'd make that distinction there. And again, Paul brings Titus along as, a, as an example. Here is my brother, Titus. He's Greek. He has never once followed the Old Testament, but he's heard about Jesus. What does he do? Does he need to be circumcised? And the answer is this. He was not compelled at all to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Why is Paul mentioning this? It's because there were false believers, as he said in verse 4, that had infiltrated the ranks of the churches to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and make us slaves. Church, I want you to hear this. I'm going to say this very clearly. The gospel is about freedom. The gospel is about us walking freely in a relationship with God that is so dynamic, that is so world-changing, that it changes everything. That it even stands above even our temporary circumstances of this day. The gospel is freedom. The gospel is what calls us in to this new divine reality, um, the, to this new world that has taken, uh, that has been born as a result of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is so crucial that we know that the gospel is about freedom. But as I said to you before, gospel freedom is not confrontation free. Just like in Galatians we're going to have people either in our lives, in our churches, from the world, who, as Paul says, want to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and make us slaves. That looks a number of ways. Sometimes that looks like people who want to keep you in a form of religious law-keeping, which is clearly the case in Galatians, where these Jewish Christians were coming to these Gentile Christians and saying like, hey, you got part of it. You're missing some. Get circumcised. Obey the Torah. Don't eat this kind of food. Worship only on these days and times. That still happens in our day. And the only way that you are going to preserve the gospel is to know it deeply and to stand firm in its freedom. That means you're going to have to confront that, whether personally with a person or just with your own convictions in your life that you will have to reject that teaching and go a different way. Let me take it another level, maybe one that's maybe closer to home that we can identify with. Is there something in your life that you struggle with um, as a way to earn favor with God? As a way that you feel closer with God because you don't do this certain thing. I remember, I'll be honest with you, I remember when I first became a Christian, um, I had a, uh, a religious spirit in me, a legalist spirit in me. Uh, even though I had been freed from all sorts of bondage, I developed the spirit of judgment on people who smoke cigarettes, uh, on people who uh, you know, were frequently missing church, you know, just whatever it was, like, I, I know that that wasn't from God. That was a way that I was, I was trying in my own spirit, in my own heart to say, look how good I am. I'm not like these other people. Uh, I'm, not like, I'm not smoking. I'm not missing church frequently months at a time. You know, and, and just, it was, it was dark. That's not from God. That's not resting in the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. That is, in a way, bolstering my own self-righteousness. And I needed to repent. And God convicted me of that. And friend, if you're a Christian in that boat and you struggle with that, you feel condemned because you haven't been able to kick a certain behavior, maybe a habit or a, or a hang-up. I want you to know, God loves you right where you're at. But he loves you enough not to leave you there. And chances are, from reading the scripture and whatever, you know, praying and worshiping and being part of a community, you know that you're that there's some things areas in your life where you still are, you still need Christ to free you and to walk in maturity, and that's great. And as a church family, 
Our heart is just to connect you with God and with the right resources to help you make those maturing decisions in your walk. But it's never to condemn you. And hear me, I'm, I'm so sorry if that is what, is what other Christians have done. And I repent for God for my own sin in that area of my life. Whether I never confronted anybody on it, but I held it in my heart. And I feel like in the church today, if you're listening to me, you need to have the gospel that sets you free deep within your own heart and soul. But then a gospel that calls you and, and moves you to see freedom in the lives of other people. Not to condemn them, but to love them. And so, friends, there are always going to be people or things that try to infiltrate our ranks and spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. The only ones who can relinquish the freedom that we have in the gospel is you, is me, is us. We are the only ones who can relinquish our gospel freedom. Christ has given it to us freely. We must walk in it daily. And so God has given you a grace for your salvation. God has given you grace for the race he's called you to walk. And so I want to encourage you, stand firm in the freedom of the gospel. Get into this book of Galatians because it gives you the meat of what the gospel is and how it can work out in the life of a believer. All right, moving on to verse Six, as for those who were held in high esteem, whether they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. That's another great underlying passage right there. The gr when they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All that they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that I had been eager to do all along. So again, this kind of outlines Paul's meeting with the apostles. Peter, James, and John, or Cephas, as it says, which is another uh, name for Peter. Um, and it, Paul is very clear that when he laid out the gospel that he preached, that he preached to the churches, Paul had been preaching for 14 years, you know, um, and so, um, actually 17 years, excuse me. He had been preaching for 17 years uh, before this meeting, all right? So he's laying out his gospel. He's saying, guys, this is what I preach among the churches that I travel on. And that he says that they added nothing to his message. That's powerful. That the, the Holy Spirit had revealed to Paul everything <laughs> right and true and good in the full counsel of God. And that these other believers, Peter, who walked with Jesus, James and John, who were there the whole time, said, hey, there's no difference between our messages. Only God could do something like that. Only God could speak to someone halfway around the world and say to them the same thing that he's saying to you. This is a divine miracle. I mean, we could read that and be like, oh, cool. But we pass over the fact, man, that God is so passionate about spreading his world, his word, excuse me, among the word, the world, the world or one of them. He's spreading his word among the world. He's so passionate about that, that he'll speak to and raise up anyone. He doesn't care about their resume. He doesn't care about their past. He, all he cares about is them being fully abandoned to Jesus Christ, and he'll use them. One preacher says it this way, God doesn't care about your ability as much as he does your availability. God is looking for vessels to pour out his word to that will be faithful to carry it on, to receive it on as their own, and to preach it freely to those who need it. And so that's what happened to Paul. Remember, Paul never uh, walked with the early disciples. He was to totally against them. He was totally on the opposite side of the church and of Jesus Christ. But as Paul says, when Jesus showed up to him as one abnormally born, he calls it, everything changed. God revealed his grace to him and that he had been entrusted to be 
the messenger to the Gentiles. And so it was very significant that the early apostles recognized Paul's message and added nothing to it. Further, this is what I wanted you to underline. They recognized the grace given to him. Let me camp here for a moment. I have repeatedly said, I'm going to say again, and y'all are going to get tired of hearing me say that, but you are called. You are called. Every Christian is called. Every person is called. Not everybody receives the call, but every person is called. Let me just say it that way. Every person is called primarily to a relationship with God. It's all throughout the, the New Testament. Even in Galatians chapter 1, where Paul says in verse 6, the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. That's God's call on all humanity. God has primarily called us into a relationship with him. Everyone can respond to that. And I hope you respond to that today, if you haven't already, my friend. But secondarily, everybody is called to a specific way of living in the world. that You can call it a mission, a, a commission from God. I also, the Bible talks about it as, as ruling, as reigning, as expressing God's rule, God's authority over something that he specifically placed you in. Could be a nonprofit that God's called you to open and run. Could be a business that God's called you to pioneer. Listen, you didn't just do that because you're also wonderful and talented. You did that because God has called you to do that. Because God has gifted you, entrusted you, spiritually equipped you to be a, a, a great leader, to be a super creative person, to, to express God's rule and reign in creation. You're not just doing it because you're really good at it. You're doing it because God has a purpose for you in it. And so I, I just hammer this down in my church, and I want you to get it. Everybody is called. You have a primary calling and a secondary calling. Your primary calling is to be in relationship with Jesus. Your secondary calling is, a, is specific. It's unique. It's how you bring God's purpose to bear in your life. And that looks a numerous, in numerous different ways. For Paul, it, it entailed recognizing the grace that God had given him. That he was called, as, as he says in verse 7, and entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised. That just means to the Gentiles. That means to those who were not from Israel. God had you, When God called Paul, he brought him into a relationship with him. And then he told him, hey, you are going to be a light to the Gentiles. You're going to be my messenger. You're going to go and you're going to tell the nations about who I am. That was Paul's calling in life. And that's why Galatians is so significant. is because he's fighting against people who are saying that the thing that he's very called to do, to, to bring Gentiles, to bring the uncircumcised into the church, um, they're saying that he's doing it the wrong way. <laughs> Paul's saying, hold up, hold up. I was called by God to do this. Sometimes opposition is a pretty good indication of your call. Ooh, that's good. Ooh. Sometimes criticism confirms your call. Maybe God's calling you to do something right now. And there are people in your life who are criticizing you. They're saying, oh, well, hey, I don't know if you're cut out for that. Well, look, you're getting up in age. I don't know if that's the right thing. Well, hey, you know this market. You never know what's going to happen. I don't think that's a way. Maybe that criticism is a confirmation of God's call for you to do something. Food for thought. Another thing that we see, though, in this verse is one thing that confirms our call, aside from God himself, is the people of God. It was Peter, James, and John who recognized the grace given to Paul. They put their amen, as it were, on Paul's mission. They said, hey, we recognize that God has called you to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Keep doing that. They don't add anything to his message. In fact, the only thing they do is continue to encourage him to remember the poor. We'll get to that in a moment. But my friends... God has called you to live in his grace. 
God has called you to walk with Jesus. But God has also called you to a mission. He's called you to be and to do. My, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Ephesians 2.10, says that we've been created anew in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. Or another translation says, to be our way of life. And those good works aren't like this to-do list, this oh, ho, hum, oh dear, we have this Christian, you know, march. It's not like that at all. It's creative. It aligns with who you are, with who God's created you to be. It's as, um, it's as second nature as a, as a painter painting a painting or a, or a poet writing a poem, a singer singing a song. It's something that you're already just doing most likely because you're passionate about it, because you feel drawn to it. Friends, that's been placed there from the beginning of the foundations of the world by the Creator Himself. He's left you ha, His calling card. He's left you uh, a, a sign and signal that you were made for more. And so, Christian, are you walking in your calling? Have you recognized the grace given to you? And are you walking in it with boldness? I want to challenge you. What grace are you leaving behind? Paul says it right here. He recognizes the grace given to him. God's graced you for something. I like to say it this way. He's graced you for your race. Not for you to sit on the couch. Not for you to sit on the sideline. Not for you to say, oh, someone else will do it. He's graced you to get in the game. And friend, we got to do it. Our world needs it. People need to hear the gospel. People need to be brought to victory and freedom in Jesus. And you have it. Don't waste this grace. It's given to you in Christ Jesus. And it will never be taken away. If God was faithful enough to call you into salvation, to give you grace, to forgive you of your sin, to make you whole, to remove your shame, to remove your guilt, to remove your fear. God will be faithful. God will be more than, God will be, God will empower you and enlist you to do the very thing that he's called you to do. He will grace you for your race. You will not, I mean, you may fall, it may not be as easy as you think it may be in the beginning, but I can promise you it's worth it. I can promise you it's fulfilling. I can promise you, you tap in to the very reason that he's created you, the calling card of God. It's there. It's that secondary piece. You're called to rule and reign. Many people in life, when I meet them, they're, they're depressed. They uh, they're feel like something is lacking. And, and I have the opportunity to just share with them, listen, God's called you to reign. God's called you to rule. God's called you to something so much greater than yourself. And to be a part of a community that changes the world, the people of God. But you've got to respond to the call. So this was very significant for Paul. Paul, again, saw these apostles in Jerusalem, received the, the right hand of fellowship, as it were, was confirmed that his gospel message was the true one, that circumcision the additional matters of the law of Torah were not necessary to become a fully devoted member of the family of God. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And then, the New Testament really makes this clear, and I want to end here, is that in verse 10, the apostles encouraged Paul. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I had been eager to do all along. Now, this is very personal to me. I'm just going to be very open and transparent. I've been in church now, off and on, for about 14 years. Um, never before have I really heard or even was taught 
like truly understood God's heart and plan for the poor. Think about it. Think about it in your own life. Maybe if you grew up in church, if you didn't, I don't know. What is your response even when you hear that term, the poor? God has been challenging me this week. You know, once we moved here to plant uh, New Sound Church here to Nashville, Tennessee, um, I knew we wanted to make a difference in the city. I knew God was calling us to reach um, multi-generational. You know, he wanted us to um, engage with um, multi-ethnic communities. Like, I'm, I'm Latino. I'm very passionate about connecting with the Latino community here in, in Nashville, um, but also just bridging gaps and barriers that have been here. Um, just being a part of the work that's already been going on here. Th those are things that were, I was passionate about, being multi, excuse me, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, and, and just being a multiplying church, being one that blesses other churches and ministries. This, those were at the foundation. But just like anybody else, I have my blind spots. I have my places where God still is working on me and the word is still convicting me. And here it is right here. Paul, the ultimate church planner, had been eager to remember the poor all along. The New Testament understands that God loves and cares for the poor, for the downcast, for, the, for those who are overlooked in society. In fact, in the Old Testament, God had made specific laws and provision that even if you owned a field, you could not pick every, um, every harvest. You had to leave some on the outskirts so that the poor could come and eat. And the social fabric of the Israelite community, if they saw a stranger in the middle of the city, and it was very clear that they had no place to go, nowhere to rest, no food to eat, that they, the Israelites, were to invite that person in. Church, there are hundreds of scriptures that speak to this reality. That we are called to be the kind of people that care for the poor, that identify with them. In fact, one of the earliest criticisms of the church, which really wasn't a criticism, it's really like a, a brag on us, was that the, the, our earliest numbers were women, widows, and the poor. Women, widows, and the poor. It was something about the gospel that was changing people in such a real way that they were meeting people who were outcasts in society, who were considered less than women, widows, and the poor. The church was the one who were, who were flipping that on its head and saying, no, these people are made in the image of God. These people are called by Christ. These people are worthy and valuable and loved. And just because they don't have proper social standing or everything that they, the society says they should have, they still have been offered the greatest gift, Jesus Christ. And they can have freedom in Him. They can have love in Him. They can have a new family to be a part of. And this family will take care of them. This family will elevate them. This family will help them find out the very thing that they're called to do. The poor are called to do something, to be someone. The widows, the orphans. Church, that's still a commission upon our day. And I want you, honestly, before God, to ask Him, what's your heart for the poor God? What role do I play in serving them and loving them on elevating them, on letting them know the call of God. Listen, every one of us is someone that we don't see. Maybe when you're driving, you don't, you don't see the person on the side of the road begging for money. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you don't see those struggling with mental health, maybe in your workplace, Maybe you don't see the families who are raising their 
young children with developmental disabilities like autism. Maybe you don't see that there are victims of labor and sex trafficking in our cities. Every one of us has something that we don't see. But the gospel confronts us. It says, we serve a God who sees everything. And he calls his people, his children, his church, to be all things to all people. To see them. To love them. To engage them. As Paul says, to remember them. Remember the poor. And so maybe a step for you this week, as you're praying, as you're diving deeper into gospel freedom, is to ask God, what's something that I don't see, God? Who's someone that I'm overlooking? What's an area that I may be even called to serve? And help me to do it. I can tell you here at New Sound Church, we are eagerly praying and seeking the ways that we can partner with God to alleviate real needs in our city. We have food deserts here. Food desert is a place that has really no access to the right food. We've got kids because school is not in session who are missing meals. In fact, I'm going to be honest and I'm going to ask for prayer. Um, in our city in Nashville alone, they're needing hundreds of churches to partner with metro schools to reach the deep needs that exist all around. I mean, that's for food, that's for tutoring, that's for childcare, that's for so many different needs. And my heart is God has called His church, God has called Nashville to be a light for the nations. How can we leverage all that we have to serve the needs that exist here in our city? And so we're doing all we can, partnering with uh, United for Hope, which connects local churches with um, metro schools. We're, we're partnering with food banks. We're partnering in every way that we can. Uh, and you know, I would invite you to pray about helping us in that. Maybe you can give to that this week so that we can partner and that we can meet the needs of the poor of the overlooked. Maybe God may be speaking to you specifically to get involved in something in your city. But this is part of who we are as the body of Christ. To remember and to eagerly engage and be generous. Because remember, if a generous God called a sinner like you and me, who really brought nothing to the table, man, we ought to reflect his generosity to the world. Regardless of the person's circumstance, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, whatever, we go because we see them as made in the image of God and we've received such a grace, we ought to walk in grace to them as well. So church family, I love you. Remember, gospel freedom is not confrontation free. You need to stand firm in the gospel. The only one who could relinquish your gospel freedom is you. Remember that God's called you specifically to a relationship with him. And he's called you and entrusted you with grace to a specific and unique thing, a way of living in the world. And remember this, nothing should be added to the gospel message. Not circumcision, not Sabbath, not food laws, not anything else. For full favor and acceptance by God, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. And when we um, gather together next week, we'll be going through uh, Galatians 2, 11, 19, where we'll get to talk about justification, justification by faith in Christ alone. And I'm very excited for that. But let me pray with you as we end our time together. I pray that you take this time maybe to uh, put on some worship, get in an area of reflection and meditation before God. 
and have them speak to your heart and things we talked about today. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to pray with my friend. Thank you that you love them. Thank you that you've called them, God. Thank you, Lord, that today is another opportunity, another day that you've given them breath, that you've given them life, that you've given them opportunity, Lord, to see you for who you really are. And God, as they see you, they are changed. We are changed by your grace, by your miraculous love, by your unfailing, unending love, God, by your power through your Holy Spirit that you are moving throughout the earth, God. I pray that you would raise up your church in such a real and powerful way to meet needs, to receive the grace given to us, to recognize it, and to walk fully in the plans that you have for us, God, to meet the needs of the poor, to see those who are overlooked, God, to engage in our studies in such a real way, God, that people see, wow, God is among this people. God is among this people who he's raised up in Jesus, and it's amazing. Lord, I pray, God, for those who are struggling with some sort of bondage, God, whether it be religious bondage, whether it be spiritual bondage, God, whether it's something that's keeping them, Lord, from really living out their gospel freedom. God, I pray, Lord, you would remove that from their heart and mind. I pray, God, that they would get into your word, and your word would do what it does best, which is, which is separate, which is bring conviction, which is, which is reveal the truth about who Jesus is and who we are and what your plan for humanity is. And so, God, I pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, um, to just see you for who you really are. And if those are areas of our life where there's bondage, where there's a religious spirit, God, where there's a um, maybe even just a, a spirit of lust and sin and license that, that, that people are thinking just because they have grace, they could do whatever they want. Lord, no, it's your grace that transforms us. And so I just pray, God, that you're, you would meet us in your word. You would do the heart surgery and, and, and spiritual surgery, God, that removes those things that are hindering us from truly walking in freedom in Jesus Christ, that we are free to be who he has called us and created us to be. And so, Lord, I just pray that for my friends this week. May this week be blessed. Lord, may everything that they touch, God, um, have your favor and your grace in, uh, upon it, Lord. Lord, I pray that they would see your name as a strong tower and run into it, Lord, when they're feeling anxiety or depression or fear. God, I pray, Lord, that even as they sleep, your, your word would instruct them, your word would come to them, Lord, that even as they are resting in their job or are talking amongst their friends, Lord God, that your word would dwell richly in their hearts, that they know that they are deeply loved, incredibly free, set apart for the gospel for such a time as this. Lord, do your work in our lives. Help us to see who we don't see. Help us to move in the direction you're moving in the earth today. Help us, God, to partner with you in the unique and creative ways that only we can today, Lord. So we thank you for who you are and for this message today. May it bear fruit in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, I love you. If you want to connect with us, you can visit us online at newsoundnashville.com. There you can send your prayer requests. You can give online. You can connect with us in any number of ways. Remember, we're always on Facebook and YouTube, so you can view our past messages and engage with us this way. We love you so much. Let us know how we can serve you this week. Be blessed as you follow Christ and are obedient to his name.